Welcome, welcome, welcome to our final video. This is session four of four um, of music from the ground up, songs from the ground up, writing music from the ground up. It's all from the ground up. And here we are. Um, really enjoyed um, talking to you about some of the process of, you know, making music, writing music, using uh, free resources and software that is available to you to create stuff of a professional standard and even if it's not something if you're making stuff that you know is not going to be you know you're not going to be releasing I think it's great to build up a set of skills and um, <clears throat> a new way to kind of express your music even you know it's it, it's all about ideas and it's the reason why people buy <laughs> such old gear and synthesizers and all sorts you know is because <clears throat> it's inspiring it's inspiring to be using new um tools um to create something that in itself is an inspiration sometimes um in today's session um i fear it may be a bit of a waffly one but um, we're going to be talking a little bit ha about how to release your music, how to get it out there and wh what to do, what's important, what what should you do, what shouldn't you do. Um, and spoiler alert, but just as with everything else, <laughs> there are no rules. And um, sometimes, you know, the most bizarre things work and sometimes they don't work and they're just bizarre. Um, and that will hopefully make some more sense a little bit later on. Before we get there... Um, I'd like to have a quick look at just a couple of other things to do with our track that we've been kind of slowly building together over the last three sessions. And we talked, you know, to recap, we were talking about how to use microphones, what microphones are even, and um, how to plug them into audio interfaces and to use that going into our computer to record the sound of a piano. Um, but you could easily record anything you like. You could record record guitars or anything like that. And, you know, to just get started, all you need is a microphone and audio interface. To get started, started, you don't even need that, as we found out in session two, where we were looking at MIDI instruments, and we recorded a very realistic-sounding upright piano from Spitfire Audio. Um, and you can record that, and it sounds almost exactly like the real thing, which is mad. You know, it's pretty amazing we live in um, a time where that's possible. So that is what we did in session two. We were experimenting with MIDI instruments. There are MIDI instruments for anything, of course, you know, so we can you can do strings and all sorts as well. You would be surprised by the number of film soundtracks even now, which will use, and TV programs especially, that will use synthetic string sounds. Um, and then they might have one or two real um musicians who play over the top of the synthetic strings to kind of make it all sound that little bit more realistic um so you can try that at home as well especially if you're a string player you know it's a great opportunity to try what would it sound like if i was leading an entire orchestra and you can do that really easily with a midi string sample um or orchestra sound um that was session two. In session three, we were looking at mixing some kind of fundamental skills, some EQ. What is an EQ? Um, what does it do? What do the button, different buttons mean? Compression, um, which we're going to mention briefly in a moment again. Um, and we also had a look at delay, reverb, and uh, panning as well. So what I've done, if you want to have a little look at the screen here, is I've just polished up what we've been doing a little bit. I've added a tiny little chime sound at the very end. Nice. Just to kind of send us home. I've done a little intro, which I'll play in a second, and I've just restructured a couple of things. So I've just made... I've added this crackle sound, which I'll explain in a second. And I've also just duplicated these chords at the beginning so it's a now a different intro you'll see there's some automation going on as well and that's just for volume so i'm going to play it from the beginning and you can hear um if you like the changes or not unfortunately i won't know if you do like them or don't so i'm not going to change them either way but hopefully you do like them um it's just kind of turned it into a slightly more cohesive little piece so here we are here is ground up <laughs>
And there you have it. And even then, I couldn't stop tweaking some little bits that I just heard. I thought that could all be a little bit louder at the beginning, maybe. I don't know what you think. That sits a bit nicer, doesn't it? Um, anyway, so there we go. I'm really pleased with it. I think it sounds, you know, considering we went in with no idea, we've ended up with something which could definitely be wrapped over. There could be some kind of horn lines that I think I might have mentioned in the very first video. Uh, which could go over the top of this, or it could be the basis for a, a song, or could even be used in TV or film, or like advertising even, you know, it could be some like little backing incidental music. So it's very flexible, even at this stage, we've created something, we don't know what we're going to do with it yet. And, you know, the creative process really is that, you know, sometimes you might make something, you don't know what it's going to be yet, and that's okay. And you've just got to kind of see it through to the end, and you end up with lots of ideas that you can kind of choose and kind of learn from basically and you might be like oh, I don't like the sound of that one and you don't have to do it anymore do something else or you might be like I like the chords from that one but nothing else just take the chords and try something else then you know so you you'll end up building this sense of kind of what's it all for and you know should I carry on making something or should I leave it now or you know all these things will kind of come into place as and when but let's assume for now that we are beyond happy with the mix and it's you know we're, there's nothing else we could possibly add or take away to make it any better um and we're going to send this off to get mastered now mastering is a part of the kind of song making process that is often mystified and kind of like oh how does that even happen and for the longest time i i wasn't really sure what mastering was and here we are here is here is what it is it's ultimately the process of being sent a mixed tune that is otherwise ready to go you know there's no you know the songwriters and the producers are all happy with how it sounds and all that kind of thing and now it needs to be ready for playing on youtube and spotify and on the radio and also from your phone and in the car and whatever so it's the process where we take a track that's done and we try and polish it that just tiny bit more, making it ready for um, all these different places where it could be played. And we want to try and, the dark art of it really is trying to get it to sound good on everything, whether it's from your phone or from like a car speaker system. And they're two very different things. So it is a bit of an art to try and process the audio in such a way that that um, musical you know, integrity or whatever is maintained so it sounds good everywhere that's the aim that's the mission and you'll have heard i'm sure there's some old songs you know sometimes which are mastered incredibly well and some are mastered not so well compared to our modern standards and actually even modern tunes sometimes the quality varies to be honest um but you know there's a history in mastering in that you know you go back to where um you know even like with mixing, the idea of mixing in its most fundamental form is that, you know, you're balancing all the volumes and the tracks. So back in the day, if you only had one microphone, it meant literally people were standing closer to that microphone if they were quieter. And, the you know, often the drums would be right at the back of the hall almost. And so you get this sound which reflects that where the clarinets and stuff are right up against the microphone and the drums sound miles away because they are miles away. And so that was before, you know, you could... You, you know they were recording onto like wax cylinders and all sorts back then but now um you know between then and now there was obviously mixing consoles and desks and multi-track recording so you could kind of change the levels of different tracks um, and record at different levels and change them afterwards which was very useful um and now we're at a point where we can have hundreds and hundreds of tracks just on our laptop or on our ipad even and be chopping and changing stuff and doing all sorts so in many ways it's kind of an easier job now <laughs> um but also kind of more difficult i guess but you know we have to balance everything and get it ready for lots of different places and um you know at least back back in the day you knew it was going to be played from our gramophone or it was going to be you know whatever um played somewhere with just one speaker and sometimes with two speakers and you know there's a lot of old jazz records even that have the drums and the bass for instance on just the left ear and you know the horns and the piano maybe in the right ear and you get this kind of crazy sensation listen to it on headphones now because it's too extreme <laughs> um but if you listen to it through speakers often it can sound quite nice 
because that's how everyone was listening to it back in the day. Anywho, we've got um, some mastering to do now. So what we're going to do is, you know, what I would encourage you to do is to bounce your track. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So what I've done is I have selected the range where our track exists. So just before it starts till just after it finishes. And then the render track we want is master. That's going to be our master track. I'm actually just going to, before we do this, I'm just going to turn it up. Just to be clear, I've gone to file and then export audio video, just to be clear. And we're going to the master now. And I'm going to export this um, using these settings. So the render starts at, you know, halfway through bar four, which is what we want. That looks right. And I'm just checking that the, the length of it looks right as well. So it goes from four to just the end of 19, which is right. Uh, sample rate, 48 is generally a good one. <laughs> you can kind of choose any of these, but um, 44.1 or 48 is kind of industry standard for different things. We don't need to go into that right now, but either of those will be fine. And then we export it. And then we need to save this. We're going to save it to um, our desktop ground up. There we go. And we'll save it there. Ground up MP3. Now, uh, you can save this as an MP3 or a WAV. WAV will maintain the quality even better, but it will be a larger file size. And MP3 is less, um, more compressed, so it's a smaller file size. So this is um, going to be as an MP3. In fact, I'm just going to cancel that. Just going to redo that with... Uh, just make sure we've got a WAV file. There we go. WAV, export that. PCM, encode PCM. Ground up, WAV, export it, and there it goes. So it's just doing that for us. And what we're going to do is, you know, I find it easier sometimes, you know, to separate the two processes between mixing and mastering. Um, so you can bounce your track, and then you've got your track now in, in WAV form, and it's just the entire um, project. So if I search for ground up, which is our folder where this exists in, there we go. And then I can open that folder and ground up and I press play. There it is. Now, when you've done that, you will definitely hear some things that you want to change and that's okay. Um, but you know, you should be trying to get to a point where you can hear these things before. I mean, um, to me, those, um, cow -cow, those little, not those, those are now too loud. That feels a little bit better. So this is one way of doing it. You can export your audio and then begin the mastering process. What we're going to do, because I'm, I'm a little bit paranoid because we haven't spent loads of time on this, that we might hear some other things we want to change, not in the mastering chain, but actually in the mix. So what we're going to do, it's a little bit cheeky, but we can do this here. In We click on the master track, which is the track we were bouncing before, which is to mean to like save or export the audio from. And we're going to add some audio effects to the master. And this will allow us to you know, change the sound of the entire project. Now, I caution you not to do this too early in your project, because if you start changing things here, then you start changing things back in the original tracks, then it's a bit of a recipe for disaster because you don't know where things are getting changed from and why it sounds different to how you think it should sound. And so it's a bit of a job. So instead of that, wait until you're doing the mastering process, which is what we're doing now and then come on to it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly load up a couple of plugins that I know for sure we are going to need um, and just kind of load those in. Um, and I'm gonna talk you through what I've put in there and why I've put it in there as well. So I've got a few different things. So. The first thing in our chain is an EQ. So here's another EQ. So it looks a bit different to the one we were looking at before, but you'll see along the bottom, we've got 20, 50. These are our different hertz, our frequency range. So if I press play, you can hear that. I'm just gonna turn this back down again. So you can see all the frequency range of our track. In real time. And FabFilter does a cool thing where it saves kind of these peaks so you can see which bits are poking out and which bits aren't. Um, there's a lot of kind of audio science 
and sound kind of uh, acoustic science, I guess, um, around what to do at this stage. Um, and there's just some kind of things that I do each time that work, I know will work and help. So one of the things we can do is we can look at um, the mid-side relationship. Now, um, when we were talking about panning, we have left and right. These are both kind of, um, this is kind of like information that goes to the left ear or to the right ear or to the left speaker or to the right speaker. Um, mid and side is um, a little bit different. So because our s song, our tune is in stereo, i.e. it is going to the left and to the right, there will be some sounds that go straight down the middle. You know, when we were panning some of our bass drum, uh, some of our drum sounds on the drum rack, we kept the bass drum right in the middle because we knew that that was going to be, it would sound a little bit strange if the bass drum was just in one ear. So we kept the bass drum in the middle. So that is in mono. That is right down the middle of the sound. There will be some sounds that are out to the left or to the right more than they are in the middle. And these are our side sounds. So our hi-hats, we'll be able to hear some of our hi-hats in the sides as well as um, some of, uh, of the spatial things we've done, like the reverbs. So the reverbs, to create the illusion of space, you know, if we choose a stereo reverb, it will pan things to the left and right in kind of conjunction with the space that we've chose chosen. Um, and that gives you, that makes it sound like you're in a space. So even though we've only done a little bit of reverb, you'll be able to hear it. So what I've done is I've changed this EQ from left to right to mid to side. Now, if I change the panning here to, um, <clears throat> to just mid, we're just going to hear it in mono. We'll just hear the mids. Um, the middle, <laughs> sorry, the middle panned. Uh, content if you like so just the stuff that is in mono just the stuff that is coming straight down the middle the stuff that is kind of like equally represented in left and right exactly the same level which is most of our track sounds pretty good yeah yeah I'm pretty pleased with that um, it then does jump, doesn't it, forward, so let's just check a little bit further on. <laughs> Let me get that chimes. I forgot about the chimes. So that sounds good to me. There's sometimes little problems emerge in when you lis listen to it in mono. But it's really important to check that because um, if you listen to your mix in mono and hear any cha any dodgy kind of little moments, you can start to fix those in the EQ off them. And when people listen to their on their phones, if they're out of phone speakers or anything like that, or if they're listening out of their uh, any anything which just has one speaker, you know, even if they're listening out of their laptop, you know, for the most part, you won't hear that in stereo. You'll hear that in mono. And if you're hearing it in mono and it sounds bad, then it's going to sound bad in a lot of places. So you want to make sure it sounds good in mono. Um, it also gives you a really good foundation then for when we start tweaking things in a moment with. Um, relation to compression and that kind of thing. So listen to it in mono. Make sure you check that it sounds good in mono. The sides. Let's have a listen. So the sides, remember, are just our stereo information. It's all the stuff that's not in the center now. All the, So this will sound a little bit strange. It will sound like it's around you, but not no, nothing in the middle. So you can't hear any bass drums in the middle, really. I can hear like, a like occasionally. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of these. I'm going to make it just affect the sides. And I don't want any bass information in the sides. Um, I want some low end because it gives me some space. It makes things sound wider. But I don't want too much information. So I'm going to just see what that's too much. That's good. That's a little bit more tidy. Let's see what let's see what effects that that has had. That was the main thing I was looking out for when we were looking at this here. I'm actually going to give this is something I wouldn't normally do. I'm just going to give the bass end a tiny boost. Mm -hmm. 
that's just the bass drum. I'm just listening to that. Just a tiny. Mm. Yeah, I'm pleased with that. That's a good addition. Yeah, just a bit more punch. I'm going to get rid of some of the bottom end right at the very bottom because I don't think we need it. end is just the tiniest bit. And it's okay for the most part. I don't have to do too much. And bearing in mind really that this is, uh, we're, we're looking at tiny adjustments here. This is hardly anything. Yeah, we don't want to be doing lots. If that hi-hat sound is too loud, we should be fixing that in the mixing stage. So we should go back into the mix and change the volume. Whereas for me right now, I just think generally that could be a little bit softer um, in context with the whole thing. And what we're doing is we're building up this awareness and the ability to kind of affect multiple things at once. And the more things that you kind of group together and affect together, the more things start to sound like they're glued together. And this is like, you know, really important, especially if we're using instruments that don't you know, not acoustic real life instruments that we've recorded because otherwise it can all sound a bit kind of like everything's recorded very separately in different spaces and different rooms with different microphones and then it doesn't sound very cohesive. So we want to make it sound cohesive, make it sound like it's from the same project. And one way of doing that is affecting everything together. So you can do that, you know, if you have a string section rather than EQing every single string microphone maybe there's four microphones for each of the string quartet and you could maybe eq each microphone but a tiny bit for like utility but then group all four tracks together as a bus and then do some eqing and compression on all four at the same time and what you'll get then once you've done that is a much more cohesive sound which is what we're always aiming for uh, for the most part, unless you want something to sound really separate, but that would be a little bit unusual. But, you know, voiceover work, something like that, you don't want the voice to sit in the mix, do you? You want it to sit above the mix, so you can kind of do the absolute opposite if you're doing that kind of thing. Anywho, so that's sounding good to me. Um, what I've got next to this EQ, which we've just been playing with, just a reminder, we've got another EQ which is one by Marg Audio, um, or it's a it's an emulation of a Marg Audio um, EQ. Marg, a, a, you know, great EQ. Um, this, well, this is a great EQ. I enjoy using this. But I'm just going to see if I can use any gentle EQ on the master here to just bring it to life that E a little bit more. So let's have a little play. because I haven't messed around with this tune that much outside of these sessions, I'm still enjoying kind of tweaking with the sound a little bit more than I would. This is a little bit unusual for me. I wouldn't be messing around with um, the EQ that much on the master process. But, you know, we're, we're, we are where we are. But I, I quite like that. You know, it's very subtle. Very, 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 very subtle. That piano almost sounds like a guitar now. It's really interesting. We've got those two EQs now. Now we're moving on to some. This this is a bit of a bewildering pr plugin. I will I will admit. Um, but you're just gonna have to take my word for it on this one. <laughs> we're gonna unlink the two sides. This the left side is the mids. This right side is the sides. We've talked about those before. And what I'm gonna do is um, very briefly. Um, activate a bit of a compressor on the mids and just see you can see it working here this is how much the gain's being reduced 
I don't want it to kind of suck any of the life out of the bass drum, so the compression from the bass drum, I want to keep that the same. So instead, it's just going to affect everything over 100 hertz. So that's kind of, you know, all our bass information is below there usually. So um, we should be able to have it so it still kind of pops a bit, but we kind of lift the volume generally of everything. Well, compress the volume actually for now. Now, if we solo that by turning off the other side, you'll hear it's in mono, which is what we were listening to it in before. So by doing the opposite thing, we'll hear the sides. There it is. And we can do a little similar thing. We can boost the compression, see how we're looking. And I think, actually, turn up the gain a little bit. So we're going to just give it an extra decibel of gain. And this should, by just increasing the volume of the sides versus the, mi um, the mono channel, uh, the mid, the mid rather, we can kind of make it sound wider than it actually is. It's a little bit of a trick of the mind, but we just make it all feel that little bit wider, a bit more kind of wide sounding. It feels good to me. It's nice. So this is kind of utility, really. I'm not hearing loads and loads of effect of this just yet, but it's little percentages here and there. Now, um. I've, I'm currently plugged in. My um, interface is the UA Apollo, and um, it has some great kind of um, analog processing power, I guess. But you can kind of use some old EQs and that kind of thing, which I would be tempted to use. But I'm trying to keep it all in the box, is what we call it, um, so that you could kind of join in. Um, I'm just going to group all of these together so we've got them in one, one place and the final thing we're going to change here is the volume of the entire track now minus 14 lufs what on earth does that mean well you know it's like the loud it's the loudness unit um and most people would say you want your track to be sitting around minus 14 and so you know use some of the presets experiment i'm going to use one here i think i might go for a basic one maybe just modern Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to play our track and we'll see whereabouts it's sitting and it's nowhere near minus 14 right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly turn down my headphones. So I don't get absolutely blasted as I turn it up. And I'm just going to turn this up. I'm just going to reset this. anything too um, crazy happening here in terms of reduction and let's just quickly talk about what a limiter is doing a limiter is like an extremely aggressive compressor yeah we're using the gain here and unlike a compressor which will um, squash anything that goes above it a certain amount a limiter will literally crush every single thing that comes above the threshold which is often at zero um but you can make the threshold at any way output level wherever you like so if i put that to minus 0.1 for instance everything below 0.1 minus 0.1 uh, decibels will get you know that it is impossible for the sound to be louder than that so it brings it down um, and different limiters operate kind of in different ways in terms of how they sound when you cross the limit yes yeah, so they're very much like it's like putting a lid on a can you know there's no beans coming out of that can <laughs> um, no matter how many beans you shove in there yeah um, so that's what we've done and th that's the final step really so if we have a listen to our track with without all this effect it's obviously a lot quieter It's also a bit more lively. I really think those um, EQ changes we cha made and the difference. Just a little bit more lively, I would say. A little bit more lively. Okay. 
And we can hear those reverbs a little bit more clearly now as well, which is nice. So there we go. What we would do is we would bounce that out one more final time, which we'll quickly do. And we'll call that uh, ground up two, which we've uh, now master, or maybe we'll call it master after that, master. Save it, jobs are good, and once it's done exporting, everybody's happy and we can all go home. Unless we want to move and put our audio somewhere else. Now, I'm going to slowly recline because I no longer need to actually um, use my laptop, which is exciting. Um, you've made your track, and that's obviously very exciting. Um, but what do you do with it now? And the reality is you can do all sorts of things with your music now. You could put it out onto YouTube or Spotify or Tidal, Apple Music. Um, and all of these like individual places have their own like portals for you to upload your music to. You'll need to create an artist page and then upload um, your track. The other option is to create a DistroKid account. And I know a lot of people, um, personally and professionally, who have used DistroKid. I've used it as well. And it's a really good all-in-one solution, which you do have to pay for. But you select all of the different platforms that you want your music to perform on. And there are hundreds um, on there. And you fill in your artist information, all the rest of it, and then they... It automatically create your account and upload your music for you and also takes care of all the royalties streaming uh, you know how much money you need to get paid and all that kind of thing so it's a really easy way comparatively to get some good results um so i would heartily recommend looking into distro kid d-i-s-t-r-o-k-i-d distro kid um if not though you can upload it pretty painlessly all over the place you can upload it to soundcloud which is a good option um for just hosting your music and for people to comment on there's a quite an active community on soundcloud and the other place which i would very very much recommend and maybe even prioritize above all of them is um bandcamp and bandcamp is brilliant because they give 15 percent uh, they only take rather 15% of the money from uh, purchases and 10% on uh, merchandise from memory. And it compare, compared to, you know, Spotify, you know, the pay per stream is so small. It's such a small amount of money. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some sort of um, revolution against that from the music. I mean, there already has been s something of a music revolution. Um, or people talk. People are talking about you know, Spotify and um, Amazon and Apple Music as kind of places which don't really compensate musicians for their time in terms of creating music um, and all that kind of thing, which is a topic for another time. But um, Bandcamp are really good and they have uh, Bandcamp, Bandcamp Fridays every now and then, which um, if people buy your music on that day, you receive all the profits, which is great. And yeah, so I definitely check out Bandcamp very easy to set up a artist profile page on there it's very user friendly and a really good community and they definitely value um and there's there's still kind of a little bit of an indie scene but definitely worth looking into 100 percent. so that's Bandcamp, um and you can kind of create all of that so what do you do do you just chuck all your music up there well you could and do a very quiet release and then gently tell people about it but it depends what you want to get from your music if you're creating this music for um a classroom or something like that obviously there's not so much a need to put it out publicly on spotify and things like that you could very much probably fulfill what you need for it by putting it on um soundcloud or even like a google drive folder or dropbox you know to share with your students or parents or of students or anything like that so you know that's that's a pretty obvious one but if you've created something with a band that you're in or you've created something for yourself and you want to release it, you want people to stream it or download it or buy it from you, then it might be worth considering a bit of a strategy for that and thinking about what's the best way to get the most amount of people listening to my music, if that's what you want. 
um which you know why wouldn't you if you're pr- if you're proud of it then absolutely that's what you should do um so have a plan and you know this plan can take many different forms different shapes um look at what the professionals do and see if you can copy that you know there is always um like teases of songs on social media and social media is a big topic anyway but let's let's dive into it a little bit you there is untapped audiences on social media so it isn't it is probably a pretty worthwhile use of your time to try and garner some attention and some new fans and an audience on social media there you know there are ways to kind of play the algorithm that change all the time but you can do some googling and research and find out some of those ways um a lot of the time it boils down to having people interact with your video or with your content tiktok is massive and will continue to be massive probably for at least the next few years so it would be a worthwhile investment of time to get used to how that platform works jumping on trends getting involved commenting on other people's pages so that you are lifting your profile from someone who just posts occasionally to someone who is actually giving back to that community in that space this is kind of the the core of it is really kind of getting involved and you know you can have the best content in the world but if nobody knows you exist then what's the point point? and the way to make people know that you exist is to have that content and also be kind of replying to comments when they people comment to you show that you're kind of like engaged you're posting regularly um and all these kind of things and eventually you will see the benefit of that i'm sure um it's a tricky and quite sometimes quite demoralizing space to be in i will grant that absolutely um whether that's instagram facebook tiktok um or any anywhere else even um but look to kind of online in terms of you know being online and that kind of thing it's valuable it is valuable and it can be valuable um people do make a living off of these services um you would do well to make a living off of tiktok i'm told you know you'd need at least you know two million streams a day or something like that to sustain kind of the average living wage so you need to be some some serious content needs to be done and i don't you know it's unlikely that any of us will reach that level but it's not impossible um but it's a comp it's you know it's part it complements a wider network of activity that you do online that will help um it's about kind of trying to tie together the other thing is to tie together your facebook page where you might have some fans with your instagram page which you'll have some other fans and your tiktok page and you know whatever else your blog your website your linkedin whatever it is um and you know it's a full-time it can become a full-time job in some in some ways but you know you're trying to garner an audience get an audience and also have a place to refer your audience to you know it's if you're writing and making music you there's a good chance you might be performing as well so mentioning all of these kind of social things that you're doing online and that kind of thing also will help you know get your real life fans to kind of engage with you online and be there and try and you know reply and all that kind of thing there's definitely i think i buy into the notion of developing your fan base locally is a, is a, is a really big thing for sure um because it's kind of like you want it, to develop your if you develop your immediate fan base you know have some core strong core fans they will go and tell people and spread the good word as it were um, about what you're doing and you know they're the kind of people that you want to develop in the first place um so especially if you're a new artist getting some core fans you know and to be honest you know if it's a case of taking that online getting friends and family involved to share with their networks it's all about expanding your network through kind of organic means if possible so using people you've actually met in real life and talking to them and you know asking that question of you know would you mind sharing this i'm i'm doing this gig in a couple of weeks and i'm like it's actually i'm going to release this single that i made you know for the first time in like a month by the way and so you know you build all of this into your plan um it's a case of having that plan in the first place and trying to stick with it as best as possible you know but um i I guess in addition thinking if you're releasing an album if we take that as an example 
um, you've got kind of six or seven songs, maybe eight or nine songs, and you might release. You know, your plan might you know take six months to kind of see from beginning to end, and the very beginning is announcing that you've got an album that you're working on and going to release soon. Um, and then a month later, you might say, I'm going to release a single in three weeks. And you do like a countdown, you know, you do three weeks worth of content built around how I made the song, who's played on the song, microphones I used, brands that I've used um, during kind of the process, some behind the scenes footage, a question, Q and A's about the song. What was the song about? How did you write the lyrics? Um, you know, all these kind of things, collaborating with people as you go you know bigging up people that have inspired you and you know there's always the chance that those people will reach back out you know and say thank you for getting in touch and you know what can I do to help and oh, I'll share your song when it comes out all that kind of thing so you know building all of this into uh, the process is kind of key um, that organic um yeah organic kind of authentic i guess the goal is really to be as authentic as as possible um you don't really want to go to, i mean unless your thing is to have some kind of persona in which case obviously go for it but um for the rest of us i think that authenticity is kind of the thing that will you know it's the best champion of yourself is is that authenticity um yeah i guess uh I'm just checking my notes here, but the, the one of the the you know there's large audiences to reach online, um, but building up your in, your your immediate fan base is important. It's free advertising at the end of the day online as well. It doesn't cost anything to use TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, uh, unless you want to pay for advertising, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but you can do all of it for free, so it's kind of the only limit is how much time you have and how much you value your own time um, to put in. Um, but you know it's it's definitely worthwhile um the last thing i was the last couple of things on those platforms um it struck me to mention that you know if you're new to it study how people are talking on social media you know they don't people want to be spoken to as if they are the person who's listening and this kind of came from originally from when the bbc were first kind of doing news reports on uh, the radio on the on the on the on the, on the ground, <laughs> as it were, was back then, um, and you know they were establishing a whole new medium, and that meant how do we talk to people when they're just sitting at home? And actually, they figured out really people like to be spoken to as if they're the only person who's listening. So talk to people, you know. And I realise now at the end of session four or four that I've been talking mainly as if I was talking to a group and maybe really I should have been spoken as if you fancy doing this you should do this thing or maybe you could try maybe I have been speaking like that or maybe I've been too self-critical it's been um but you can basically think about that when you're talking to your audience it's one person and see how it feels so you try it out and you know it might feel a little bit odd but I, I promise you when it, it's a kind of standard that people are used to now and um you know it's it's more engaging there is definitely some psychology behind that as well um but it's how to talk to people absolutely um there's just some ideas about how on earth to go about building up and a fan base and you know starting to release your music it's about getting it out there it's about creating it but most of all it's about kind of having fun creating music that means something to you and you know having being that creative person who takes that leap is brave and you know commendable and whether you're doing it for yourself or for others or um you just want fancy giving it a go then i wish you the best of luck it's a tricky thing at times but it's hugely rewarding i mean even just creating this little tune today is like i have enjoyed it <laughs> um and you know to be sure it's kind of it's the thing that's tricky about it finally <laughs> the thing that's tricky about it or the thing that maybe people don't appreciate is a fair way of putting it is that by taking on the mission and the mantle of creating your own music from start to finish you are effectively becoming maybe 10 different people 
all who have full-time jobs. If you are, you know, I don't know, Dua Lipa, I'm, I'm sure she writes some of her songs, but I know for a fact that songwriters write her songs too. <clears throat> and the reality is Dua Lipa is at the very end of a long chain. And I, you know, I like a lot of Dua Lipa's music, so this isn't a criticism, but this is the reality of it, which people don't realise sometimes. But, you know, there are songwriters at the very beginning and there are lyricists and they will collaborate together a lot. And there are not just two people, but they, that might be a songwriting group or a team and it might be a ly- lyrical team as well. So at the very beginning, you might have up to six or seven people, maybe more, working on a song. That song will then get produced in its you know first form and then get sent across and it might be like, oh, yeah, we like... You know, the record label or Dua Lipa might, herself might be like, we like that song and they will choose that song out of a list of songs probably. And, you know, then it goes into th- their team and then they have producers who will sit there and kind of do bits of what we've been doing, talking about the song, the chord progression. Do we like this? Do we like that? What instruments should we, should we use? What production techniques? How should we mix this? And when we get to the mixing, there's someone else who's mixing it, you know, and it gets passed around to different producers a producer might do the drums on a track, then they pass it to their other producer friend who does the bass and some of the synths, who passes it to their friend who does another thing. So that's like a whole other thing, network of people who get involved. And then it goes to a mixing engineer. Alongside all of this, by the way, though, is um, engineers, studio engineers who are working in the studios doing the technical stuff as well. So this is like a huge team. And then it goes to a mixing engineer. And then that final product which is then sung on and kind of created and bounced and whatever, then gets sent to a mastering engineer. And that then, you know, we then have the mastering engineer who does their job. And then it still doesn't get released because then there is a huge marketing team at the record label who go about posting on social media, taking out adverts everywhere, whatever, a huge team doing all of that and then eventually Dua Lipa having sung the song maybe six to nine months ago goes oh yeah I need to learn that song again and then sings it on a kick maybe you know so or has their kind of whole press release tour where they're singing it on Graham Norton and they go over to the States and sing it on Jimmy Fallon or whatever and then eventually the song gets released and then she might sing it on a tour but then the tour's a whole other thing so you know we're trying our best to kind of create a a song that lives up to the standard of maybe 20 or 30 people's hard work their jobs are to do this and which might not even be our main job and we're trying to do it so what i'm saying is don't be disheartened um keep plugging away because it will happen and you will get better and you will be so surprised by just by listening and making decisions you know on things that sound good how far that will get you and you know you're be inquisitive ask questions do research and honestly it will be a matter of months or maybe even weeks if you've got time and you will be making stuff that you won't believe that you were making in the first in the first place um if you have any questions um that you can't find the answer to online drop me a line um and uh, reach out to Nymaz and they'll put you in contact with me if you have any questions um if not then it's been an absolute pleasure i hope you've found this useful um and hopefully we'll be able to do this live and in person at some point too that'd be great thank you very much i've been josh savage see you soon <laughs>